Welcome in to hit him. Welcome, Welcome in to hit him. Hi, thank you, my face, Mark. Scott Tyler right here with Ember Shelley and, of course, Eagles legend Seth Joyner. We're here each and every week at the Fox Casino and breaking down the Eagles' victory against the New York Jets, the pitiful New York Jets as they were <laughs> yesterday. Reminder to share this video with all your friends and family and colleagues on Facebook or YouTube because for every share we donate one dollar to a charity. Last month we donated over a hundred dollars to the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation, so good job, but let's increase those numbers. This month, big brothers and big sisters, so be sure to share this video for every share we will donate one dollar to brothers and big brothers big sisters and guys we knew the jets were going to be falked when sam Darnold wasn't going to be the quarterback the philadelphia wow. eagles yesterday became the first team in nfl history to record 10 sacks and score two defensive touchdowns in a game Seth, big day big day and you know anytime the eagles win it's a major deal anytime the eagles win and the Cowboys lose on the same day, it's a really <laughs> big deal. Um, but, you know, everyone's excited about the win, but I, and, and there, there's a lot of talk about how the Eagles won. You know, I always say, you know, how you win sometimes is, is, is as important as, you know, is, is winning because it's a, it's a future indicator of how you're going to play, how you can potentially play, and, you know, you, the Eagles have got some work to do on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, it, we finally started off fast, finally got off to a, a quick start, and all of a sudden we stalled out. Um, and against a team like the New York Jets, you know, we had 11 possessions in that game yesterday. And out of 11 possessions, we had to punt five times. That should mm -hmm. never be the case against a team like the New York Jets. So, you know, it, it, listen, over the next three weeks, we've got, you know, some tough opponents coming up. And if we play the game, against those three opponents, the way we played yesterday, uh, we might not have any shot at winning, at least on the offensive side of the ball. The defense was, was, was fantastic, was spectacular. To be able to come up with 10 sacks, to be able to come up with you know two defensive touchdowns, that's major. But from an offensive perspective, you cannot count on that. You cannot, you cannot count on that on a weekly basis. I mean, when was the last time we had such a defensive performance? Um, and, and it's called a team for a reason because, you know, when one phase, whether it's the special team or the offense or the defense, isn't clicking on all, all cylinders, it's up to the other two phases to pick up the team and help you win. But this team is built to be an offensive juggernaut. This team, all the money for this football team is spent on the offensive side of the ball, and they've got to start performing that way or, you know, our playoff aspirations are going to dwindle down really fast. So it's basically the tale of two sides. So we, we noticed last week the offense had a lot more flow to it. They were running the ball effectively. Carson Wentz didn't have to do as much. They were effective. They won the game. And the defense looked bad. We saw Devontae Adams doing exactly what he wanted out there. Mm -hmm. He got hurt. That was probably the only reason that they won that game because without him out there, Aaron Rodgers really had nobody to throw the ball to. You come in this week, the defense literally lines up against Grinnell College. And if you don't know who Grinnell College is, that D3 school who had to cancel their season because they didn't have enough good players on their team. <laughs> You know, that's what it looked like out there. I mean, but when you look at the offensive side of the ball, here's something that's going to blow some people's minds. Luke Falk, who everybody clowned about how bad he was, only had two less completions and 60 less yards than Carson Wentz, and he was sacked nine more times in the same game. If that's not alarming in terms of statistical ineptitude on Carson Wentz's part, I don't know what else is. Now, a lot of folks say, oh, well, they didn't have Deshaun Jackson. If Deshaun Jackson is the difference between week one Carson Wentz and what we're getting now, that's a big concern because what we do know about Deshaun Jackson is he typically doesn't play a full season. He hasn't played a full season in years, and he always misses with these soft tissue, hamstring, you know, groin injuries, things like that. Don't get me wrong, they're important because he's a speed guy. That matters. But if the offense is predicated on having that one guy being able to stretch the field, they got Nelson Aguilar literally running wide open. Nobody's throwing him the ball. Smart play. And I disagree on well, that. Well, we, we already know. <laughs> but the point is, if you've got that, you have those kinds of problems in terms of being able to put up offensive production. I mean, granted, they're finally giving the ball to Jordan Howard. We're seeing him touch the ball more. But, you know, why not 20, 25 touches? You know, we know that he falls forward on almost every play. We see Sproles kind of get banged up. I mean, these are all things that are concerns. What is the offensive philosophy that's going to keep this team being able to score when you go up against a significantly better team like the Minnesota Vikings next week, like the Bills in a few weeks, like the Cowboys in a few weeks? These teams have significantly better defenses that you come out playing like that with five punts, you're going to be down two, three touchdowns. There were a lot of empty possessions, for yeah. sure. 
there were, and, and against the Jets defense that is pretty talented, let's not take anything away from them, although they were without C.J. Mosley once right. again, and we've seen other teams be able to move the ball very effectively against this Jets defense without C.J. Mosley in the middle. The fact that there were so many empty possessions, you mentioned the punts, it is concerning. You mentioned Jordan Howard. He shared snaps with Miles Sanders. They both played the same amount of snaps, but I felt like the usage wasn't what it should have been. Right. We saw Miles Sanders catch that nice pass out of the backfield on the wheel route. Why isn't he more involved in the passing game? Why isn't Jordan Howard more involved in the short yardage situations? They got to start converting these third and mid-range yardage or, or else they're going to have more empty possessions. So. I think that, you know, you talk about I, you talk about who are they and what are they trying to accomplish. And I look at the Philadelphia Eagles offense like um, like they're the Gemini right now. You know, the new movie with Will Smith is coming <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like you get you get one guy one guy one game and another guy another game and and I think their problem is is they haven't really defined who they're going to be they know that they need to be a running team but Doug Peterson just can't bring himself to embrace the fact that that's the best course of action for for his quarterback and when you turn around and you you sign a quarterback you know to a 33 32 million dollar a year contract there's this there's this incentive this need this feeling that you know you want to try to justify that. If the name of the game is winning football games, then they need to get rid of this Gemini, you know, identity and define what they're going to be. Run the football, bring play action alive, and everything in your playbook, you're going to be able to throw it out there and throw it at, at defenses. You know, Carson, you know, when I watch him play, listen, he's a superior talent. There's no doubt about it, okay? But... He's got to make some throws that he's been missing the last couple of weeks. Elite quarterbacks don't miss wide open guys running down the field. He's got Nelson Aguilar wide open for two touchdowns yesterday that he overthrew him. And you can't make that mistake. You've got to figure out how to put it on him. You know, Doug Peterson's got to adjust the way he calls the game because great offenses, what they do is they never try to force the issue from a passing standpoint. You know, yes, you want to impose your will when you're running the football, but when you're throwing the ball, you can't force that. You've got to be able to take what the defense is giving you. Tom Brady does it. Drew Brees does it. Phillip Rivers does it. Aaron Rodgers does it. All the good quarterbacks are always tr consistently trying to put themselves, you know, in second and four, second and five situations where you can go play action pass or you can throw the ball if you want to. And we're going to take those three, four yards, and then we're going to line up in third and short situations or we're going to convert on second down. And, and that's problematic for me because when you see Carson Wentz standing in the pocket and he's holding on to the football, that tells me that he's not trying to hit in, intermediate routes. He's mm -hmm. trying to push the ball down the field. And you cannot, you cannot force that. You got to pound the ball. You got to pound the ball. You got to make the defense, load the box, and then you can go play action pass when you force them to, to do something that they don't necessarily want, want to do. But when teams are sitting back in zone, you're not going to be able to get the ball down the field. You got to throw the ball to the holes, to the gaps in the defense, take those five or six yards, keep yourself in second and manageable situations, and put your, put your offense in third and short situations, in situations that you can convert. And they got to stop all the silly penalties on first and second mm -hmm. down, first and 20, second and 20. Those are almost impossible to convert. A reminder, be sure to share this video with your friends and your family, whoever, because for every share, we're going to donate $1 to Big Brothers Big Sisters. Last month, we had the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation raised over $100. We're going to do it again each and every month. So for every share, we are going to donate money. So be sure to do that. And send us your questions and your comments, because we'll answer them here on the show. We're not shy. We're not hiding away from you. You want to make a comment? Hit us up on the Facebook page and, and ask a question, and we'll answer it to the best of our ability. You, you mentioned the running game. You mentioned shortening those, you know, making three, third and short and not holding on to the ball. We talked about it every week, it seems. The strength of this Eagles offense when they made that Super Bowl run was the RPO, that run-pass option. When they are not running the ball primarily on early downs and they are not taking that run option seriously, the defense, you are eliminating that quick hit action. And that's when you see defenses keying in on the deep passing and not allowing Carson Wentz to hit somebody that's open like an Aguilar or somebody else. There has to be multiple layers to this offense. That's when it's most effective. So 
listening to everything that Seth said, you reiterated two key examples of taking what the defense gives you and trusting your run. You look at what Green Bay did against the Cowboys yesterday. Aaron Jones had a career day. Mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers barely broke 200 yards, and they beat the Cowboys in Dallas, okay? Now, without Devontae Adams. Without Devontae think, Adams. You would think they you would keep it on the run. <laughs> you expect it. Another example, and the name's going to keep coming up the more we talk about Eagles offense, Frank Reich goes into Kansas City, a place where nobody expected them to win, and pounds the football with Marlon Mack. And 49 they beat, carries. They beat them in Kansas City where nobody – listen, I didn't pick them to win. I don't think most people did. The point I'm making is it goes back to – is Mike Grow the guy? Is he the guy? Because here's the thing. We've seen since he's been here, whether it's his play calling, whether it's his ability to stand up to Doug Peterson and say, hey, we need to run the ball. The Super Bowl run, who was the coordinator? Frank Wright. What does Frank Wright do? Run the football. He lost Andrew Luck, a franchise quarterback, and they are still in contention for their division. Why? Because he runs the football and does it effectively. They don't have that identity here. I'm going to say this. Um, if if anybody believes that Mike Grow is calling offensive plays, they're out of their mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? They're out of their mind. You know, um, I don't believe that Frank Reich was really calling all of the all of the plays when he was here. But what I do believe is that he was the voice of reason mm -hmm. for Doug Peterson. Mm -hmm. He was the guy, the one guy that was in Doug's ear that Doug could trust and say, "Hey, we're getting a little pass heavy. You know, let's get back to the run game." Mm -hmm. I don't think that. You know, Mike Grow and Press Taylor have that kind of cachet when it comes to when it comes to Doug Peterson. So he doesn't have a voice of reason. He's calling the plays that he wants to call, and there's no one to not really check him, but there's balance. no one no, no one to balance out you know what he's seeing and what he's understanding. I think that he puts more validation into what you know his his. Um, his analytics guy is saying in his ear mm -hmm. that he does a Mike Grow or Press Taylor, and that's problematic. It's, it's, it's really problematic. Um, and because listen, you, I'm not going, I'm not going to not believe that, you know, that there's a lot of Andy Reid and Doug Peterson because that's who he learned from, that's who he played under, and that's who he coached under. You know, um, and some of the same things that you see plaguing the Kansas City Chiefs. Is the same things that you see plaguing Doug Peterson right now. And I think Frank Reich was the difference maker. He you was agree. the difference maker, you, you know, for, for, for that guy. T to say that, hey, listen, last night what you saw is a football tutorial in the, in, the, in the Indianapolis Colts and the Kansas City Chief game is you saw a tutorial yep. of how the game of football should be played. Yep. You know, now, what I give Frank Reich the most credit for is his ability in game to, to look at the situation mm -hmm. and say, you know, if we can't contain Patrick Mahomes, then we're going to have to Limited shorten the game, yeah. minimize his possessions. Now, the great, the best thing that happened to the Indianapolis, Indianapolis Colts last night was, you know, Patrick Mahomes getting his ankle stepped on. Yep. Because what it did is it slowed down his mobility. Mm -hmm. It didn't mm -hmm. allow him to move around. Where he's most dangerous is when he gets out of the pocket. And for the life of me, I don't understand why defensive coordinators don't impress upon their guys. Listen, if I was a defensive coordinator and I'm playing against Patrick Mahomes, I would tell my defensive ends, if he breaks contain, you come out of the game. <laughs> you come out of the game because he's dangerous enough from the pocket. He becomes that much more dangerous when you let him out of the pocket. And when, he, when his ankle got hurt last night and he could no longer, you know, just, just you know, just move around yeah. and, 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 and make things happen on the fly, you've seen a different quarterback. And I think defense coordinators are now seeing that, hey, you know, maybe that, that's the play. That's the play. Keep him in the pocket because he's dangerous enough from the pocket. But I give Frank Reich a lot of credit. He realized that, you know what, I got to adjust. And he made the adjustment in game. And he made the decision, you know what, we're going to pound the ball. We're going to pound the ball. And when we, get, when we have to, we, when we have to throw it, we're going to go play action pass. And, and, and Brissett's going to be, he's, he's not going to have this stellar game. Mm -hmm. But what he's going to do enough. is he's going to be effective and he's yep. going to be good enough with Jack Doyle in the flat. With uh, Marvin, not Marvin, T.Y. Hilton, uh -huh. you know, on slants and speed outs, you know, in situations like that, and that's, in my opinion, the way the way it needs to be. You think you think he cares? You, 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 th you think that he cares mm -hmm. that that his quarterback didn't didn't rack up a bunch of yards? They rushed for 180 <laughs> yards last night. That's all <laughs> he cared about. To Get win. the win. You're in right. hostile territory against probably the the number one offensive team 
in your in your conference, okay, and you went in their house last night when nobody thought that you could do it, and you took it to them, old school style. And one of the most impressive stats, at one point in the second half, their time of possession was up to 18 minutes while the Chiefs only had the ball for three minutes. Three. That was right. just incredible when they posted that up on the screen. Let's get some questions here up on Facebook. Jay's Johnson from the uh, Philadelphia Eagles Zone uh, Facebook group says, what are we gonna? What, when are we gonna take the top off? With no Deshaun Jackson, we're not gonna go far with other teams stacking the box. So how do the Eagles do that until Deshaun Jackson comes back? We all know when he's back, they're gonna be able to do that. But without Deshaun Jackson, how do you take the top off? Well, and unfortunately, the option they have is Nelson Aguilar. But that goes to Seth's point. If the man's open, even if everybody in the world, including people in the city, are afraid he's going to drop it, you still got to throw him the ball. Give him a chance to make a play and trust that he's going to make it. You got to put him in at least the opportunity to see if he can catch that ball. If he's open, get the ball to him mm -hmm. and see what happens. Now, he's the only one with the speed that can actually force the defense to have to play that cover two or sit over top with safety help. But outside of that, there's really no other way to do it. They don't have speed guys. They've got all possession guys outside of him. He's the only one with any sort of speed. So the only option they have is try to utilize ways to get him in creative situations, to try to drag that safety, get downfield, kind of stretch the play. But the other thing is how much of that is scheme? Because again, like Seth said, Carson's holding the ball way too long. Mm -hmm. So is it the fact that the coverage is there and there's just nobody getting open, getting separation? Is it the fact that he's only looking for a certain type of guy to get open? What is the issue? Because when Carson holds the ball too long, we see it's trouble. We see he normally takes a sack, he takes a hit, he doesn't want to, or he makes a bad play with the ball, whether it's a pass and a complete, something like that. Those are the things where I don't know if that's, they got to coach better, they got to find ways to create different styles of plays that are going to make the openings happen, or just run different sets of schemes with double tight end sets, maybe sending Goddard down the seam along with Ertz, double tight end sets, just to try to find ways to open up that offense a little bit. I think, I think you hit on something, and I, I, I blame Doug Peterson <clears throat> for the underutilization of, of Nelson Aguilar. Because in my opinion, what Nelson Aguilar is, Nelson Aguilar is a post, a go, a corner, a, a, a every once in a while, you know, a bang eight type, mm -hmm. of, type of wide receiver, okay? He's a down the field guy. I mean, you, we've seen flashes of it over the years, but they tried, they've tried to make him a, a slot corner and that's not what he is. I mean, even when Carson's throwing the ball, there's certain throws that he throws to him. And I'm thinking to myself, man, you gotta know your personnel. You know, I'm not throwing Nelson Aguilar the types of balls that I throw to Alshon Jeffries. No. He doesn't have those kinds of mm -hmm, hands, mm -hmm. okay? But if you can get him down the field and give him something he can run under, okay? You can give him something that he doesn't have to worry about the safety coming to blow him up, you know? He can be special. You watched him yesterday run by the Jets' defensive backfield on two different occasions, wide open. You cannot miss that. So now, okay, d -Jacks, He's a different animal. Right. He's a cheater. Yeah. <laughs> there, and there's there's there, there's no, no there's no debating that. Okay. But Nelson Aguilar ain't that far behind. Mm -hmm. he, he's not that far behind. And the problem is, Carson has built up this repertoire with with Deshaun Jackson because Deshaun Jackson just got back, and he hasn't built up that repertoire with Nelson Aguilar. It's pretty evident in the, the amount of balls that he consistently overthrows to him mm -hmm. when he's wide open. Either the ball isn't placed in the proper place or he just flat overthrows him, okay? So now, how do you rectify that? The same way that you work with Deshaun Jackson, all, all OTA, all training camp, all preseason to work on the timing of that deep throw, you've got to dedicate some, some additional time because we don't know even when D-Jax comes back, we don't know that he's going to be 100%. We don't know he gonna be, he's going to be able to open it up. I would, I would presume that when he comes back, he's going to be a little hesitant. Because if whatever's bothering him, if he comes back and he tweaks it again, it's a wrap. You, yeah. he, you, you can put him on the shelf. You can put that Ferrari on the shelf for the next six to eight weeks. Mm. Okay? So they better be trying to figure out what plan B is and how you're going to in, in, incorporate Nelson Aguilar in your vertical passing game. Because you know what? He can do it. They just have not utilized him in that way, and they have not developed that part of their parting game, that, that passing game, concerning him. Let's bring it back to the defensive side of the football. Dustin James Downing on Facebook asks, how many of the 10 sacks yesterday were due to the Jets quarterback, Luke Falk, holding the ball too long, and how many of them were just straight up good plays by the Eagles defense? I will tell you this. There, there, there was a report that came out in the pregame that 
You know, Adam Gates, man, I am so glad that he got on that plane and left here after his <laughs> after his interview and didn't take the job here in Philadelphia. I mean, when, when you watch that guy, everyone should be ecstatic. Not only because Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl for us, but because of how he handles his business. So there was a report in pregame yesterday that Adam Gase was so hopeful and so adamant that Sam Darnold mm -hmm. was going to play Dummy. that he gave him all the reps. All the first team all reps. All the first yes. team reps in practice last week. Until Friday. And, until and, Friday. Until Friday. And how are you going to take a young kid that's a rookie that should be on a practice squad and not give him any reps whatsoever? Oh, so, listen, I... What the, what the Eagles were able to accomplish, listen, they beat, they beat an offensive line to be able to get to the quarterback. Yeah, maybe the quarterback didn't know what he was doing, didn't know where he was looking, didn't, didn't know where mm -hmm. he should be going with the ball, couldn't identify pre-snap what was going on, whether it's blitzes or what the situation was. But, you know, I'm not going to take any credit away from the Eagles defensive line. Not, not the fact that, you know, they went into week five and they only had three sacks and they walked out of week five with 13 sacks. <laughs> I'm not going to take that away from them. <laughs> You know, because Adam Gase, you know, did some dumb things over the over the pre previous week in New York. I'm just not going to do that. Really and and it, it was impressive. Also, the Jets were replacing two members of that offensive line. Right. So the Eagles completely took advantage of that. I want to take some time out here and I want to introduce a very special guest to the show. He is Tom Halinski from Kingsmark. We can't do this show without the folks at Kingsmark. You, so we wanted no to problem. introduce Tom to our audience. Tom, thanks so much for stopping by no and problem. joining thanks us Thanks for here. having me on, guys. On Hit them High. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. I, I don't want to take up much of your time. Just a quick plug for Kingsmark. Uh, we're a full custom cabinet shop. Uh, we work in conjunction with Holinsky Contracting to take care of anything you need done at your house. Um, Look us up on Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, look us up on the web, kingsmarkcabinets.com. That's all I want to say about that. Let you guys get back to the football. Well, Seth raves about you every week, so <laughs> well, you, know, you guys must be doing something right, you know? Yeah, Thank always you. doing something right, no uh, doubt about it. I want to get back behind the scenes to uh, listen to what you guys have to say, but uh, if you could, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say about Brandon Graham and his three sacks yesterday. It was a big day, man. Career high. It, it was it was a big day, and um, I'm going to the whiteboard in a little while. I'm going to break you down. You do it. I'm getting out of here. I'm, 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 I'm back I'm, behind the scenes. I'm, I'm going to break down my thoughts on Brandon Graham and, and his big day yesterday. Thanks, guys. Thanks, All Tom. Right. Yeah, no well, it was a career high. Three sacks for Brandon Graham out of the 10 ET. And, and you had talked about this earlier in the year about where Brandon Graham has been positioned. So, so Brandon Graham has spent a, a good portion of his career on the outside as a defensive end. And one of the things we talked about when, you know, they were trying to figure out how they were going to configure the line was putting Brandon Graham in different positions along the line. You see it a lot with guys like, you know, J.J. Watt, where they'll move him along the line and kind of give him an opportunity to create things and wreak havoc. But Brandon Graham has such good speed. And the fact that he's a little smaller than most but has that ability to get inside and shoot that gap really fast, you saw the advantage of that because, listen, the guard and the centers just don't have enough time to react to how fast he is. He hits him with a quick move, boom, he's in there. And this is something that early in the year I said, hey, maybe if you move him along the line and give him an opportunity versus just coming off the edge, very, very predictable. You know what he's going to do. The tackling kind of position himself to be ready for him. You put him on the inside where the guards aren't as prepared for him. Now he has an opportunity to wreak havoc. So those are one of the things that in looking at what they did differently, credit to Jim Schwartz for identifying that, especially with the changes along the O-line that they did, you know, seeing that there may be opportunities and then utilizing that as a means to definitely create, you know, some havoc that was going to give Luke Falk trouble, you know, especially coming in with literally one day of preparation. So, I mean, you know, what do you want to do? But Hey, listen, to break it down even better than me, we're going to kick it over to Seth at the whiteboard. I tell you, you know, it, sometimes when you listen to players in post-game interviews, you can kind of get an idea of, you know, what the coaches were thinking during the week. And you, I heard Brandon Graham say yesterday that there were some opportunities that they felt like they, they could take advantage with some matchups. So, and and I'm, I'm going to present to you today a reason why Brandon Graham, in my opinion, should be permanently moved to defensive tackle. And you can either play Josh Sweat on a consistent basis. You can play um, Deshaun Hall on a consistent basis. Both of those guys got sacks yesterday. Um, you know, when the Philadelphia Eagles signed Malik Jackson and they signed Tim Jernigan back, the thought was they would man this right tackle position. Malik Jackson is more of a pass rusher than he is a run stopper. Most of the time, what you get at the defensive tackle position, you either get a guy 
who is a major run stopper, who never gets any pressure on the quarterback, or a guy that's a pure pass rusher, and he doesn't want to play the run. So when you look at a guy like Aaron Donald, he's the rare exception. When I think back about my, my old teammate, Jerome Brown, he's the rare exception of a guy who can play the run and rush the passer when you have to have that. So the, the, the Malik Jackson move was to bring in a guy who could create pass rush and take a lot of pressure off of Fletcher Cox. We know that Fletcher Cox can be that guy when he's 100% healthy, but when Malik and Tim Jernigan got injured, it left a void right here. We've got some run stoppers here, but we don't have any guys that can pressure. Now, most of the time they move Brandon down here in their NASCAR package. That's their third down package to rush the pass in obvious passing situations. But I submit to you that Brandon Graham is the type of guy with his size, with his stature, that could get down in here and create problems. I always talk about Fletcher and how in passing situations, they're going to turn and they're going to double Fletcher. If that's going to be the case, Malik Jackson was that guy to beat one-on-one -on, -one on this side, okay? So in order to force this not to happen for Fletcher, you either got to move this tackle down in that gap that forces the center to, to, to look this way and slide protection the entire way or allow them to continue to do that and get a guy like Brandon Graham in this position. If you go back and you watch the film, Brandon had a heck of a day yesterday. Why? Because he's a move guy. He's got good feet. And most of the time when you put a guy, an offensive lineman, at a guard position, it's because he doesn't have good feet. So all the moves that Brandon has, okay, here, coming back around, here, going inside, that can be huge. Now, whether he can play the run from that position, that's a whole nother ball game. But when you got a small guy like that to help him be able to play the run, you move him, shoot the gap, move here. I think going forward, the Philadelphia Eagles really need to consider moving Brandon Graham, the defensive tackle. And I think that's going to help this defense in a myriad of ways, not only in the running game, but as far as the pass rush is concerned. And now you're going to force this center to not double Fletcher all the time, to spring him and let him loose and let him be the, the player that he, he needs to be. Because there's no way in the world you're going to lay 600 pounds on Fletcher Cox every single Sunday and think he's going to be the Fletcher Cox that we need him to be. Guys. It was an impressive effort. The Eagles, a pick six and a fumble return for a touchdown in the same game. The last time that happened, the body bag game, November 12th, 1990, against the Redskins. You might remember that. Well, maybe you might not remember that. Oh, I remember. You might remember that. I game. remember. <laughs> that was, it, we, it, we saw a little bit of like a Buddy Ryan defense oh, yesterday. <laughs> I, I think one of the, the things that's really great is you, you've noticed in the last two weeks, key critical plays coming from guys who weren't supposed to be on the field. So you saw James with the big stop in Green Bay, the Green Bay game. And then this week, Orlando Skandrick literally said, you know, he was disappointed 12 years in the NFL, never not being on an opening day roster to literally being signed to come in and play because of injury. City Jones, not seeing time, and then coming up with a key critical play. I can attest. OK, sometimes for players, I don't care whether they're young or whether they're old, you know, the most important thing that can happen for them in their career is a little humility. Mm -hmm. You know, I was cut the first two games of my rookie year. When I came back, I came back with a whole different mentality, a whole different mindset. You could tell Orlando Scandrick, you know, missed the game of football oh, yesterday. Yeah. And being cut for the first four games of the season, he comes back the first game he's back, he's a man on fire. I mean, sometimes, sometimes a little humble pie goes a long way in getting adjusting guys' motivation. And, 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 and he made some big plays yesterday. I don't think anybody was expecting for him to come up and play as big as he played yesterday. You know, you mentioned that Green Bay-Dallas game was sick this time to go around the NFL. Some of the things that we noticed in Sunday's Week 5 action. And those Packers go into Big D and they handled their business without Devontae Adams. Aaron Jones, a career day against that normally stout Cowboys defense. And, and I think, I, I don't know if you want to credit that more to the fact that Aaron Jones was running like a man possessed or that Dallas took them lightly because they didn't have Devontae Adams. I mean, you figure anytime you've got a healthy Aaron Rodgers, you're expecting a shootout. You saw, even in the loss, he, you know, he threw all over the field against the Eagles. You know, then he comes into this game, paltry 200 plus yards, yet they win handily. I mean, they were ahead for a good while this game. I mean, Dak didn't exactly play well. Lots of turnovers, 
Again, back to the defense, what was working. Those Smith boys were really causing havoc on that defensive side of the field and keeping those guys under control. Amari still did what Amari did, of mm -hmm. course, but Ezekiel Elliott didn't have a monster game. They weren't running no. the ball, and that put them in bad positions with the turnovers. I mean, you, you look at it, listen, three weeks ago he was the darling. I was one of the people who said that he's playing great football, but now you look at what he's doing and it's like, hey, you know, where is he? Is he still worth the guy that we thought he was? So. Listen, I, 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 from my perspective, I, I say this. Um, as far as the Dallas Cowboys are, I think it's a combination of things. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the perfect perfect concoction hangover. You know, you, you got the Dallas Cowboys coming off of an embarrassing loss to the New Orleans Saints without, a, without Drew Brees. And then the combination of um, them starting off 3-0 and and everyone singing their praises with wins over the Giants, the Redskins, and the Miami Dolphins. You know, and everybody thought that I was a, a, a cowboy hater, which I am, <laughs> which, 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 which I am. Everyone thought I was a cowboy hater when I said, just wait until they play some real football teams, mm -hmm. okay? So, you know, they go into New Orleans with a major rematch because if, if we remember on Sunday night, late in the season, the New Orleans Saints went down to Dallas and got embarrassed on national TV. If you don't think that that was still stuck in the New Orleans Saints crawl, you're 100% wrong. Mm -hmm. And the way they got demoralized in that game, um, you know, with a backup quarterback again, um, I think there was some hangover from that. Then, you know, you get the Green Bay Packers coming in, and the Green Bay Packers are feeling some type of way because the Philadelphia Eagles have just come in and beat them, you know, and t taken away their undefeated status on Thursday night football in front of the whole world to see and just ran roughshod all over. You know, ran the ball for 176 yards. And I guarantee you Mike Pettin said, hey, they, the, 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 the Dallas Cowboys will not run the football against us like the Philadelphia Eagles did last week, okay, or some heads are going to roll. So they roll in the big D, they lock down Zeke, and their game plan was to put that ball in Dak Prescott's hand. Mm -hmm. And he failed miserably. Yep. He failed miserably because you know what? You, you, you got a defense that can pressure them, and if you can get, I've always said it, I've been saying it ever since the two of those guys, Dak and Zeke, has been in Dallas. You know, you've got to get Zeke under control. If you get him under control and you put the football game in Dak's hand and you can contain him and keep him in the pocket and get pressure on him, he'll fold like a cheap Samsonite every single time. And that's what you've seen the last two weeks. And right now they're in a tailspin. I mean, you look at Jason Garrett last night. When have you ever seen Jason Garrett yeah. losing the way he <laughs> lost it last night? And then for Chris Collinsworth and and, 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 and and the rules official to say, oh, that wasn't that egregious, I ask you the question, would a player get away with throwing a tantrum like that without getting a 15-yard penalty? Mm. That penalty was 100% justified. And for them to say that it wasn't, 100% wrong. I, excuse me. It was Troy Aikman. Troy Aikman yeah, and, 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 and Joe Buck. Neither one of those guys should be allowed to do a Dallas game ever again. <laughs> but, but, I'm just, but, but I'm just saying, Dallas is in a precarious position right now. You know, they, they're going to get a reprieve next week because, you know, they, they, get, a cup, they get a layup next week. Mm -hmm. But the big game is when the Philadelphia Eagles roll down there. And, and if we continue, if the Philadelphia Eagles can continue to play defensively the way they played and figure it out on the defensive side, on the offensive side of the ball, the Eagles could very well walk out of, walk out of AT&T Stadium with a one-game lead in the, in the NFC East. Which now, would be huge. Which would be huge. Major. Now, now, the one thing I'll say to piggyback that, and I know a lot of people aren't talking about it, but one of the strengths of the Dallas Cowboys has been their offensive line. Mm -hmm. We know Tyron Smith and Leo Collins are both injured. They're banged up. That matters because those are your two stud tackles. Welcome to the world of injuries. Stud tackles. Welcome to the world of it's injuries, football. Dallas Cowboys. It is. It's hey, listen, the Philadelphia Eagles have, have had to endure this for the last two years. When yep. we went to the Super Bowl, people forget we had five major players mm -hmm. that didn't get an opportunity to play all season long, pretty much. Okay, we've been we had to endure injuries and overcome them to just make it into the playoffs last year. Well, the Dallas Cowboys for the last two or three years have enjoyed, you know, good health. And yes. hey, listen. Sooner or later, the injury bug is going to catch up with everybody. Right. It's how you deal with it. So I'm not going to allow them, you know, I, I'm not going to allow people to, to, to make, that, make that excuse for them as to why they're not achieving and doing what they have, have, have to do. Because nobody thought that Nick Foles could carry this team to a, to a Super Bowl championship. 
No one thought that when Carson went down last year that this team could rally and 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 get to nine and seven and get a wild card spot. Okay, so we're not gonna we're not gonna give the Dallas Cowboys that luxury. Every you know? team deals with it. It's Every football. Team. It's fair. It's Every team. That's fair. You talk, we talked at length already about the Colts' victory over the Chiefs, so we'll, we'll skip over that one. A game that I want to bring up, and I'll be honest, I picked against the Oakland Raiders every single week oh this my. year. But they were in London yesterday, and they, in the first half, beat down the Bears, who usually beat down everybody. Second half was a different story, but the Bears' defense still allowed the Raiders to march down the field and win that game late in the fourth quarter. Here's a stat I'm going to throw at you. The last nine teams to win an international game have gone on to the playoffs that season. Are the Raiders a playoff team? Uh, Are we just misjudging the Raiders here? I, I, let's I, look at the division there first. Right. Let's look at the division. One game back in the Chiefs let's, now. Let's, let's look at the division and then let's look at, you know, how the rest of the conference you know fills out. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say there's a good chance They're a because, because in the in the AFC North, there's probably only one team coming out of there. Mm -hmm. um, in the AFC East, you know, there could be team. there could be one or two. The Bills, the Bills, oh, Bills look good. Yeah. Bills the four Bills, one. The, the Bills, you know, you go to the AFC South. Um, I got a feeling that Houston's going to run away with it, and sooner or later, you know, the Minshew effect is going to implode. Okay, and then you go out to the AFC West. Not a whole lot going on out there right. besides the Kansas City Chiefs. There's a good chance that the Raiders, you know, now that I'm thinking about, there's a good chance that the Raiders could slide in. Even even as a as a wild card team, yeah. there's a good chance they can Nine make and play. seven, ten and six. Wow. I, I think look, I picked against them every week, but maybe I gotta start giving this team a little respect here. I I'll say this. I think that game meant more to the Raiders than it did to the Bears, and mm. here's why the Khalil Mack effect. So he left out of Oakland. And of course, Gruden said, oh, of course I wanted to keep Khalil Mack right, but you're the president of operations and all those things. You make all the calls. I think Khalil Mack wanted to show off and play well. I don't think the rest of the team had the same energy in the game. And they said, you know what, it's Oakland, they stink. They don't have any key wide receivers. Ty Tyrell Williams is out. All they got is Josh Jacobs. Listen, I benched him in three of my leagues. <laughs> and the guy runs wild on a team that is great against the run, which surprised everybody. But what that shows is that you never count any team out in the NFL. You ne Listen, no different than the Colts last night going into Kansas City and winning. Tampa Bay beating the Rams. You never count these teams out in the NFL. I mean, you never know what team's going to show up on any given Sunday. It is such a true adage that you never really know which way it's going to go. And you know what? Hats off to Gruden for getting those boys motivated to go play overseas, you know, different time zone. There's a body adjustment, and they came and they played. Yeah, first Way game in that Coast. new uh, Tottenham Hotspur yeah. Stadium, which cost over a billion dollars to make Jeez. and was built for NFL football. Really? So that's the difference. Yeah. This stadium was built for NFL football mm -hmm. in partnership with the NFL, so it's not I a soccer-specific yep. stadium. Tottenham, the soccer team, is playing there because that's their home stadium, but this is where the NFL we'll will now play, play its games. games because it was built for NFL football. Yep. Sounds sounds like an NFL franchise. Sounds like the, the London Jaguars are going to be there soon. <laughs> yeah, We're going to break that. down tonight's Monday Night Football matchup between the Bears, uh, excuse me, the Browns. I'm going to talk about this. The Browns and the undefeated San Francisco 49ers. But first, this word from Parks. What a night. The new Parks Casino $10 million sports book changes everything. It's a whole new ball game at Parks Casino. Watch every single game and sporting event you want on our custom-built 154-foot wide, $1.5 million screen, capable of showing 36 events at once. Bet all the hot action and enjoy tap after tap of amazing craft beer, cocktails, and puff food favorites. Your entire game day destination is here for you and your friends. Sports book, beer garden, and Liberty Bell Gastro Pub. Parks Casino, bet with the best. So Monday Night Football tonight is going to feature the Cleveland Browns against the San Francisco 49ers, and the Niners are laying five points. I get it, they're undefeated, and I get it. Jimmy Garoppolo is probably the best-looking quarterback in the NFL. I'm not talking about style of play. The guy's just gorgeous. But how good are these Niners? They're 3-0 against the teams that are a collective 3-12 this season. I'm not sure how good they are. I know the Cleveland Browns have talent and I know that they are just starting to live up to the hype. It was an impressive victory last week. I think the Browns roll into Santa Clara, because it's not San Francisco, the stadium's in Santa Clara, and I think they come away with a victory, not just cover the five, I think they come away with a victory over the San Francisco 49ers tonight. Plus, primetime games tend to lean towards the underdogs. Give me the Browns, the dogs are barking tonight. <laughs> now, 
with that game, listen, did a great job explaining that, Scott. I, I think it's going to be a, a lower scoring affair than most people expect. Listen, first of all, the 49ers are third in NFL defensive ranking. Granted, against teams that are 3-12 and 12 collectively, but defense is defense. The other piece of it is that they just, the Browns, had a huge road win against a division rival a week ago, so you know that they're coming off of a high. I think this is the classic trap game in terms of not bringing all the energy necessary. I think they still win the game. I agree with you, but I think it's going to be a low-scoring affair. I think right now the line is 47 and a half. Definitely take the under on that. First half unders have been the key, too, in these primetime games, so something to keep an eye on. Next week, guys, the Philadelphia Eagles are going to take on the Minnesota Vikings in what is going to be a very physical game. The spread is three, and let me explain something to you guys out there. Whenever a point spread is three, it's pretty much telling you that both of these teams are even, right? Home field is traditionally worth three points in the NFL. Certain teams have more of a home field advantage like Seattle or Green Bay late in the year. You might get three and a half to four points. Foxborough late in the year. We all know how good the Patriots are. What the spread is telling me is that Vegas and the NFL betting public views these teams as even. If the game was in Philadelphia, the Eagles would be three-point favorites. It's in Minnesota, so the Vikings are three-point favorites. Are the Eagles and Vikings an even matchup here? Well, uh, listen, if you're asking me if I think that they're a matchup in terms of talent-wise on the team on paper, I think, honestly, top to bottom, the Vikings match up great defensively with the Eagles, but offensively have better skill position players. Dalvin Cook is the best running back in football right now, okay? Granted, Kirk Cousins is a train wreck waiting to happen, but he's got Stefan Diggs, who's got all world speed and talent, and he's got Adam Thielen, who the Eagles will have no answer for. I think you put that together with the fact that he just got called out, and you saw how he responded. He didn't sit there taking and, and woe is me and play bad. He understood it. He came out. He got guys involved. Now, Stefan Diggs didn't have the monster day, but when they played the Bears the week before, he did. So I think that this is a game where the Eagles have to be careful about their secondary assignments, making sure guys are covering. Because, get listen, they want to make sure that the Vikings play their style of football, which is what we've seen. But you cannot let Dalvin Cook beat the brakes off you. And that's the biggest fear coming into this game. I think the Vikings are a better team. I, I do. And that is our Kingsmark keys to the game. Seth, your keys, your Kingsmark keys to an Eagle victory over the Minnesota Vikings. It's not Dalvin Cook. It's not that offense. It's not that defense. It is purely on the heels of Kirk Cousins and how Kirk Cousins plays. Okay. Yeah, he got called out last week, and he stepped up. But someone please tell me, when, they, when, when have we seen Kirk Cousins put together back-to-back -to -back great games? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm believing that, you know, he doesn't play as well. Because you know what he did this week? He got Thielen off. Thielen had a big day yesterday. Mm -hmm. Stephon Diggs, not so much. You know, Dalvin Cook is going to do what Dalvin Cook does because they're finally committed and they understand the importance of the running game. So they're going to try to establish the running game. Okay, but I would submit to you that this week, Kirk Cousins is going to try to get Stephon Diggs off. That's going to be his main target this week. Okay, and if he tries to do that, you know, there's going to be opportunities for the Eagles to get pressure. We know that pressure is kryptonite, you know, to Kirk Cousins, and I just don't expect for him to play that solidly. I think they're a good defense. I don't think they're a great defense. You know, I, I just don't. I, I think that, you know, the, 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 even though the, they lost, you know, they beat the Giants yesterday, the Giants to the Giants. The Giants, you know, Daniel, um, Daniel, Jones, um, Jones. Daniel Jones still had, you know, a pretty solid day. They didn't, he didn't turn the ball over. Um, I think if you got Saquon in that game healthy, that, you know, there's a, a the, the beat down isn't as bad as it was. Um, but I think the Eagles, I think the Eagles got a chance of going in here and winning this game just because of the pure emotion of it. I mean, you, you got to remember, the Eagles have beat the Minnesota Vikings two consecutive times in a row, one being in the NFC Championship game and then going into their house in the same stadium they're going to be playing and claiming, you know, the Lombardi Trophy. So the emotions are going to be high. You know, the Eagles are going to have to be able to sustain that initial onslaught because I'm telling you right now, the fans are going to be rabid. The defense is going to be rabid. The, the, you know, the offense is going to be trying to run the ball down the Eagles' throat, and the Eagles are probably ranked probably number one or number two in total run defense coming into this game. So if they try to force the issue too much, that's going to put the Eagles in good position defensively early in this game. But I, I think the Eagles got a good chance of going in here and winning this game because I think the Minnesota Vikings are going to be too emotional 
about this game coming up with the, with the past history of these past two teams the last two or three years? I'll make this simple. My King's marquee to the game is going to be, can the Eagles make a big play? The Vikings are going to be very aggressive on defense. They're going to come after Carson Wentz. They're going to want to bottle up whoever's in the backfield. Can the Eagles make that one big play? whether it's the Nelson Aguilar over the top or if Deshaun Jackson comes back and he plays or even if it's Alshon Jeffrey or Dallas Goddard or Ertz or somebody, whoever it is, can the Eagles make that one big play that's going to be the difference in this game? If they can, they're going to win. If they can't, it's going to be difficult. So to piggyback off of both of your points, I think it's going to be a low-scoring affair. I think it's going to be a heavy defensive game, but I think both defensive game plans are going to be the same force the quarterback to beat you. The Vikings are going to want to take the run away because they've seen what the Eagles do when they effectively run the football and try to force Carson Wentz into being the guy that we've seen not looking too great lately. And the Eagles are going to have the same approach. Eliminate Dalvin Cook. You have one of the best run-stopping defenses in football. You're going to take Dalvin Cook out of this game and make Kirk Cousins become a thrower 30, 40 times a game and try to put yourself in positions to win. I think that the keys are the same for both teams. Whoever forces the quarterback to throw the ball more will win the game because the quarterback is going to make mistakes, whether it's Carson Wentz or whether it's going to be Kirk Cousins. I like Carson Wentz a heck of a lot more than I like Kirk That's Cousins. When, I, when you I, like the, I like the receivers <laughs> in Minnesota better than the Eagles, when, though. When you balance that, when you say, when you talk about the potential mistakes that are going to be made, you know, the mistakes that Kirk Cousins has made as far and greatly outweigh the mistakes that Carson that's Wentz fair. has made. You know, so if, if that if all things being equal, that's going to be the key, then, you know, give me give me the Eagles and the three points. That's well, fair. we know it's going to be a very physical game, E.T. Well, hey, listen, thank you so much for watching. Remember to keep sharing the show to help raise money for big brothers and big sisters. Thank you again for watching Hit Em High right here at My New Philly, where something is always new and everything, everything is always new.